Welcome back to part three, the last part of a three-part series on the 1967 Hong Kong riots. In parts one and two, we looked a little bit about the conditions that caused the 1967 Hong Kong riots, the Communist, the Communist, uh, the Communist Party's Cultural Revolution, the bad working conditions in Hong Kong, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we looked a little bit about the reaction from the colonial government and the reasons why the the riots failed to overturn Hong Kong itself. Now, in part three, we're going to talk a little bit about the legacy of 1967 and the reaction from not only the colonial government, but also London itself. First, we're going to talk a little bit about the Hong Kong economy. The Hong Kong economy in 1967 actually did pretty well. Exports went up 22% and trade was up 12.4%. The open Hong Kong economy managed to meet its food and water shortages, going so far to import kangaroo meat from Australia. Hong Kong's resiliency here during times of food and water shortages, especially compared with what happened during the Great Leap Forward, reminds me of Amartya Sen's work about famines arising not just from the lack of food, but also due to inequalities in the mechanisms for distributing it. Hong Kong was able to rely on its open market ties and trade with other members of the Commonwealth. Closed-door China could not, and that those relationships and ties help Hong Kong make it through. But the 1967 riots nevertheless left both the Hong Kong colonial government and London itself quite shook. Before, it had been assumed that the refugees who came after the end of the Chinese Civil War and during the Great Leap Forward would return to the mainland once things stabilized. But now it seems like they were settling in Hong Kong for good, and that meant they needed to be taken care of. The riots only underlined that point much more forcefully. Back in London, people were wondering what the hell was going on over there in Hong Kong. Hong Kong was a British colony under a British governor. Was it being run like some sort of factory slum or something? Trade unions not only questioned the working conditions of the people themselves, the human and social costs of it, but also put pressure on the Hong Kong gov government to answer questions about the resources their rule was exerting on the colonizer. The United Kingdom was spending time and resources on its colony, but what was it getting back in return? These big British companies in Hong Kong did not pay taxes to Britain, the major trade parties there were Japanese and American. Some 34% of Hong Kong's exports went to the United States. And the United States is its biggest trading partner at the time. So what was Britain getting out of this colonial adventure? And I do want to note something here, though. It's not like those trade unions were doing this out of the kindness of their hearts. The British economy was transitioning away from manufacturing during the 1970s, and that left a lot of people anxious about their place and future in the world. Hong Kong textile factories filled by weak regulation and low taxes, regularly undercut prices on British goods, and that accelerated manufacturing's decline. Governors Trench and McLehose would be forced to answer questions back in London about what the administration was doing and would be doing to remake Hong Kong's society and economy. Social and economic reforms had already been underway, but now found renewed purpose, funded by the city-state's growing wealth. A ban on child labor, compulsory education, a 10-year housing plan, welfare benefits for the elderly and unemployed, workers' compensation, safety legislation, sickness and leave protections, the ICAC. London would push Hong Kong to clean itself up and make its economy a better one for the working people rather than the low-tax capitalist freefall it had been up until then. I have written a little bit about this before, and I hope to write more about it later. But most of all, what 1967 taught Britain was that British rule beyond 1997 was impossible. The Americans might be able to, and probably would, come to British aid militarily if the People's Liberation Army decided to one day cross the border, and together, the British and Americans might even be able to hold them off. But no nation thousands of miles away can govern without the tacit support of its people. And Chinese nationalism was on the rise, even within Hong Kong itself. The existence of the Hong Kong colony spat in the face of that nationalism and the rising fervor of the Cultural Revolution. Britain cannot keep a lid on things there indefinitely. Thus, London's governance of Hong Kong depended entirely on the whims of the Communist Party. China might be content for now to wait, but it would be getting Hong Kong back sooner or later. 1997 at the very latest. The only thing that London and the Hong Kong colonial government could do until then was to govern well and retake popular support away from the Chinese nationalists. This would put the British in the best possible bargaining position opposite Mao's successor administration in China. So in the end of it all, 1967 told London that it needed to do something about the people of Hong Kong, and London responded.
thanks for watching everyone this three-part one took a while but i really enjoyed reading it hope you all have a nice day bye, -bye.